characteristics come from rape, which stands for Rape, Abuse, Incest National Network, which is the nation's largest anti-sexual violence organization. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for investing your time with us on a Sunday of afternoon for this pivotal discussion on prevention of sexual assaults in campuses. My name is Chitra Vijay, and I am the Outreach and Prevention Associate at Maitri. And today, on behalf of Maitri, I will be moderating this panel discussion. Before we start, I would like to give you, our listeners an overview about Maitri's activities in the area of domestic violence. Maitri is in its 31st year servicing South Asian victims of domestic violence in the San Francisco Bay Area. This panel is part of its youth and domestic violence preventative initiative. Otherwise, the other activities of Maitri include uh, so providing support to survivors of domestic violence through culturally responsive services, so we are sensitive to uh, individual cultures. We provide all services for free and all services are confidential. We take great care for that. Maitri's ultimate vision is to create a society where all relationships are built on dignity, equity, and compassion. Maitri conducts regular panel discussions in order to sensitize the community and prevent incidents of domestic violence. Now, without uh, much further ado, I would like to uh, introduce our panelists. We have among our myths, Sparsh Garg, who is a sophomore at Santa Clara University studying computer science. He has been working as a Maitri volunteer since January 2022, and he joined us as an intern throughout summer. Sparsh, welcome to the panel. Glad next, to be here. Next, we have Kulsum Farhad Sabi. Kulsum is a senior student at Santa Clara University School of Engineering, majoring in computer science and minoring in mathematics. Kulsum grew up in the Bay Area, but her family is originally from Afghanistan. Kulsum, welcome to the panel as well. Next, we have Daniel Norona. Daniel is a senior year, a second year, I'm sorry, a student at Santa Clara University, majoring in management information systems at the Levy School of Business. So uh, Daniel uh, uh, goes a lot to the campus because he is a music accompanist intern where he plays piano and other instruments at events. Daniel, welcome to the panel. Next, we have Guneet Grewal. Guneet is a second year student at the Santa Clara University studying bioengineering. Welcome to the panel, Guneet. Uh, before we jump into uh, talking to our panelists, I wanna give you a preview of the discussion. Today in this panel, we will be looking at circumstances surrounding a sexual assault situation in a campus environment, the psychology behind such occurrences, basically what's going on in the perpetrator's mind, cultural barriers to reporting, why uh, incidents, most of the incidents don't get reported unless it's something extreme, and what is going on in a student's mind while they are in that situation and are not able to report. Second, then the last and the, the, the crux of our panel today is uh, the safety measures that students can take. I mean, there's a lot of documentation. There is a lot of literature on what students can do. So knowledge is power, right? So uh, first, let's take a sneak peek inside the mind of a perpetrator. What are his motivations? Why do they uh, commit sexual assault? assaults. In this context, um, I would like to put forward a question. 
do you think misogyny has a role to play in occurrences of campus sexual assault? Uh, Daniel, would you like to take this question? What is um, your experience? Go ahead. Sure. So I can I can talk about um, I guess the perspective that I have, which is that um, I don't think I've necessarily perceived it or seen it personally, just because as a, as a male student or as a guy, um, it's not something that we really are exposed to so much, but it is still there. Um, it does definitely exist. And you hear these stories from your peers and from your friends. And um, it can be really troubling to hear these stories. But of course, um, you know, the way to go about that is to just treat it with as much respect and listen as much as you can just to allow those stories to be told. Um, but, but personally, I can't say that I've, I've necessarily come across anything like that before, um, other than just hearing things from students. From students. Okay. Since you say hearing things from students, uh, is there any incident uh, where you are hanging around among boys and uh, they're saying things that are cringeworthy about women? And uh, what are your thoughts at that time? Absolutely. So I think that definitely among, um, you know, you put, you're put in certain situations where you'll be um, with some guys who get rowdy and sometimes they'll say things that are, are regretful or they'll say things that maybe don't come off the best way or they sound very uncomfortable. And, and being in my shoes, um, it's a little bit hard to speak up against that just because I'm not necessarily sure how what to say or how to say it. Um, but definitely it is something that's tough because I can sit there and I can go that that was a horrible thing to even say or even think of. Um, but in my perspective, it's hard to, to counter that, even though personally, I may not believe that, or I may not uh, choose to act in that way. Um, but it is something that happens and you do have to, to go with it and, um, you know, kind of take things with a grain of salt, right? If somebody says something, it doesn't necessarily mean that. Um, that's the way that you should view women because that I personally, I don't believe that the way that a lot of people do in college campuses is right. Um, but at the same time, uh, it is hard to speak up against those, um, those things that are just really bad. Yeah. So do you find yourself gritting your teeth in anger sometimes that, oh yeah, I mean, how can you say that, you know, but you are forced to hang around and kind of fit in and have some peer pressure at that moment and don't want to like stick out like a sore thumb, so to speak, you know? Well, I think there's, there's kind of a tough situation where you can make a judgment call where you go, okay, somebody's crossed the line. I no longer want to be here. And you make an excuse to leave. And I think that's the best thing to do in that situation, unless you feel like you're equipped um, to say something against what they've said. Um, me being me, I'm pretty shy in general. So I tend to try and leave the situations or, um, you know, if I notice that somebody constantly says something that, that isn't necessarily the most respectful, I'll just tend to spend less time with them. And that's the way that I go about doing things. Um, but what I would think would be a more ideal thing would be, um, you know, you learn from, from somebody how to address the situation better and how to respond to that rather than just leave because that's my my current point of view is just um, I don't know what to do so I'm not going to address it I'm just going to put myself in a different situation where I don't have to deal with that because it's just such a bad thing. True that's so true. Uh, okay uh, I want to uh, add one question to whatever you told me do you think that they are just saying it for fun just to you know appear like a cool dude or do you think that they, they are they are capable of putting it into action, meaning going further and causing harm to somebody? What is the impression that you get? What are they like uh, likely to do? I, I think it's really hard to make that call. Um, obviously, I would say that if, you know, let's say I'm hanging out with a friend of mine and they see something that's a little bit out of pocket or maybe something that, that isn't the greatest, uh, because they're my friend, I can tell them, hey, like, that wasn't cool. Um, but if I'm in a large group with a lot of people and, and things are said, um, it's really hard for me to gauge who will do what, um, just because I don't know them so well. Like I know that somebody who I choose to spend time with one-on-one -on -one or, or in a more private setting, um, if they slip up and say something that's really dumb, um, I think my friends wouldn't do something dumb, but at the same time, um, it, it's just hard to control other people's actions. I think the best thing I can do is control my own. Um, and from there, just hope and pray that people who are around me, um, you know, at least what they're saying is is dumb, but at least they don't act upon it. But if they do, um, that's not something that I can necessarily judge or not. True. So if uh, some person is uh, naive and does not get those vibes, 
then and they, he or she continues to hang around uh, with the crowd. So they are likely to get into trouble, right? It's also about the individual radar, you know, to gauge a situation, you know, and not get into trouble, especially when you're away from home, right? Yes. So uh, I would like to take the same question to uh, Guneet and ask her about, uh, have you encountered any of your um, male friends, you know, just friends you hang out with, you know, openly talk ill about women and normalize it basically as if it's, it's a way of life. Have you experienced anything like that? Yeah, I have actually like my, my male friends, like they'll, they'll say things that are misogynistic and I'll stop and be like, hey, like, what, why are you saying that? And they just, they, they caught off guard that I'm calling them out. And I'm like, is this normal to you? And they're like, yeah, it is. And, and I think it just goes back to like their childhood and how they see their dads treating their moms and how they see men treating women. Because I feel like in South Asian culture or I mean, a lot of different cultures, it's very misogynistic, you know, like against women. So I think it just dates back to how they not even raised because I feel like parents tell you, hey, treat women right but the actions that they're doing aren't treating women. like a dad will tell his son like do you know open the door do this but then that same dad will like yell at the mom right in front of the kid and do misogynistic things so I think it date it there are a lot of levels to it yeah and what goes through your mind when uh, they are talking about another girl whom you are not emotionally or uh, in any way connected and what goes through your mind at that time? Do you feel that, hey, they must be talking like that about me when I'm not around? Does that thought even cross your mind? Definitely, yeah. I feel like that's a really big thing. It's like, if they're talking about this random world to me, the second I get up and leave, what do they say about me? So it's like, you have to be careful with the people you're friends with, especially the men. And I've also had instances where it's like, my friends will start dating this guy who's who presents as charming, you know, does everything right and then but the second they're in a relationship with him he switches up he's controlling he's misogynistic so it's like the signs are there sometimes with a guy but then sometimes you really have to be in a relationship to understand how he actually is so it's, it's different true because uh, when they are dating someone i think they look at that person with colored lenses yeah. so to speak and the thing that you can see and judge, they are not able to do that, judge in a good way, you know, assess the situation. So, uh, so sometimes it gives you as a friend, it gives you a feeling of helplessness saying, hey, I wish I could help her from not getting into trouble because it's still early days and she can mm -hmm. back out right now. But then uh, you want to give that person their space and mm -hmm. not be intruding, not appear nosy. So it's a very tricky situation, especially you are when you are the immediate contact of the person mm -hmm. and uh, living in the dorm and you are as good as family because family is not around. So yeah, uh, but I feel like the culture is shifting a little bit in terms of women supporting women. It's like, it's a lot more common now for like a girl to come up to and be like, hey, like, that guy is no good like he did blah, blah 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 and it's like even if we don't know a girl we'll go up to her and be like hey don't be hanging out with this guy he did this and so it's like we look out for each other a lot more nowadays just because there are so many guys that present as like normal and charming but the second you're alone with them they're not so I feel like it is tricky sometimes like you have to be gentle about it you have to like figure out how to say it but I think nowadays it's like we are looking out for each other more yeah True. So basically looking out for the red flags, you know, and people can be trained to look for the red flags. Some people have it naturally coming it to them, the information, the body language and everything. But some people need to be trained kind of to observe and and ensure self-care, basically. Right. So. Uh, when it comes to uh, misogyny. Uh, according to a paper published in the Industrial Psychiatry Journal of India, uh, with the advent of social media, uh, what has happened is that misogyny over the years has not just remained a mindset. 
it has evolved into an ideology in itself. Now think about it. If you are just having a mindset of misogyny and then it becomes something like an approved ideology, it means that you have some kind of a social sanction to practice misogyny. And it's, it, there is no regret, there is no uh, facade about it. And they, and they are proud of being misogynistic because then it is seen as some kind of a cool ideology. So uh, that's pretty dangerous. So research shows that with the advent of social media, this has, uh, this has been observed a lot. And then that gives further rise to victim blaming, victim shaming, because again, everything that comes with misogyny is socially sanctioned, you see? So that's how it goes. So uh, this brings us to the uh, question of, you know, reporting. Okay, uh, so when there is misogyny around you, okay, you are afraid of, uh, or any person who is a victim is afraid of not being believed. And there are many uh, points of resistance where you don't want to stand out and complain. Or you rather uh, stay quiet and, uh, you know, and deal with it yourself as if it's some kind of a personal matter. So while there is an acute fear and resistance in reporting a sexual assault to law enforcement when it when it comes to students who belong to minority ethnic groups the reasons are multifold and concerns of societal repercussions are paramount right so i'm going to take this question to kulsum um, also, what's your experience? Please share with us. Do you think cultural and systemic barriers create extra layers of challenges for for a student to uh, to report? For example, some person might be an international student, you know, first time in the U.S. and they don't know what the system is, and uh, some people may be first generation. Americans where uh, parents uh, have their values rooted in uh, their native cultures. So uh, outside world is very different for such students. So what is your experience on the same? Yeah, so, um, you know, I actually have quite a bit to say about this. I'm sorry if this goes a little long. Well, go ahead, please. Thank you. So basically, you know, you kind of gave the example of like an international student coming into a new place and facing something like this. I feel like all that comes with an extension of the culture they grow up in, right? Everybody has some environment they've been raised in, everybody has values they have, and everybody has a mindset fed to them from that culture, regardless of where they go and the situations they face. You know, so if you look at history, you see that any person of color, that's, that's not white, from any ethnicity, any race, if they're faced with something as serious as sexual assault or any, just any, any victimology that happens to them, their chances of getting justice or help are significantly decreased just because they come from that, that ethnicity or that race. And you bring something as serious as sexual assault into it and it just seems impossible. You know, I was reading um, a report recently and it said that 95% of victims don't report because they don't believe that, you know, their abuser will get a conviction. And it's like, why is the system so ingrained and so predictable and so accepted that 95% of victims don't even report it, you know? And on the majority in these cases, it's women of color. And that's a culture that's been built, you know? It's a mindset, it's, it's a president that's been accepted and the justice system has proven that to them or else why would 95% of them just not report it in the first place? You know, that's why it's so necessary to report, whether it's on a college campus or outside of it. You know, even if there's no expectation, you have to report it. Not only does it give the victim a sense of relief, but it also holds the abuser accountable. You know, and even like the most educated women who understand that still don't report because of the culture they come from at home. You know, and this culture is one where they're taught that, oh my God, if our, our daughter is a victim, it's, it's like she's tainted. Or, or their shame because of that, or, or our respect goes down. So, 
you know, the family scrambles to hide it and cover it. And they overlook the trauma that they're extending onto their family member who's faced this, whether it be a boy or girl, you know? And I feel like that's just caging the victim in even more. It's a huge problem and it creates a cycle where the victim is the one that can't escape, you know? And these culture, cultural barriers, they contribute to silencing the conversation and the victims themselves. You know, I, I'll never understand why the world is so hell bent on creating, you know, angels out of their girls. But then when she's faced with demons and they punish her for it, you know, why should she suffer more and the abuser be free? Because then you're just creating another abuser in the world. You're enabling them, you know, and it teaches them like, oh, it's okay, whether it be in the store or on campus or, or just anywhere. So it's a matter of holding the abuser accountable and that's why you should report regardless of family and culture. I feel like that's a conversation that needs to start and it needs to continue to be talked about. It's, it's time for a change. So those are my thoughts on it. True, so true, caging the person. I mean, it's not a physical cage that you're talking about. You're actually talking about a mental cage which seldom gets uh, spoken about in our nar narratives as South Asians. Um, and okay, what will you uh, tell parents who are of South Asian origin or who are first generation immigrants who are listening to a conversation like this? What message would you like to give parents? A message I like to give them is that it's very easy to understand where you guys are coming from because you've been raised also in a certain culture and a certain mindset. We get where you're coming from. But to raise your child in a Western world or any world where they're going to face something like this, it's necessary to open up your mind to that and to understand what they could be facing when you let them out into that world. You know, if we can understand where you're coming from and why you think this way, you can change the way you think so we can adapt to this world and you can help us. I feel like that's what parents are for. They're here to help you learn and grow throughout life, you know, and if you don't change the way you think for your child, even with them understanding the way you think, it's never going to help them. It's never going to work out. So. True, so true, so well put. I mean, they need to consciously put their child first. Exactly. Okay, and then comes the community. You know, so that is typically very counterintuitive yeah. for a South Asian mindset because. Uh, South Asians tend to identify with the group more yeah. than identifying um, or having their identity defined as individuals, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they, the, the focus is on belongingness, basically. So, and go for it. Thank you. Um, I feel like the more people who do take that conscious effort to, to pay attention to their uh, child rather than society or community that's the more people that will do it themselves you know it's just a matter of someone starting the cycle and everybody else joins on yeah it's like the original culture wouldn't be so widely accepted if everybody didn't do it so if somebody starts doing something different everybody else will follow yeah like that becomes their community yeah taking you know, so to speak and for a child who is growing up here and uh, who absolutely believes that their parents loves them parents love them when they are uh, faced with a sticky situation, so to speak, mm -hmm. they have a sense of betrayal from the parents as they are growing up, you mm -hmm. know, that, hey, I thought you loved me. Yeah. And when I am facing a situation like that, you are not there for me. Exactly. You know? And that's not how South Asian parents would typically define love. Mm -hmm. You know, so they would kind of get into a self-blame kind of a spiral saying, hey, what didn't I teach her or what didn't I teach him that mm -hmm. uh, he, she is uh, protesting in this manner, mm -hmm. you know, so they take it very personally. And then uh, it's an emotional roller coaster within a family, mm -hmm. you know, and it adds to the confusion of uh, this kid who is navigating two different worlds exactly. you know outside it's a different world inside it's a different world and you don't know where to be and it takes a lot of time for you to define yourself mm -hmm. you know whether I'm an individualistic person or whether I belong to the group and you know most often the story goes like this where uh, the immigrant parents are new to the U.S. And they do not have a car. 
uh, someone helps them drive around, someone helps them get grocery, some, the community basically rallies around them when they are immigrants. So they um, feel a certain kind of, uh, as if they owe the community something because uh, they have helped them settle down in mm -hmm. a way in this new country. And there is no one whom they can relate to, especially if they're coming from countries where English is not spoken and the first language is something else and they are uh, depending on others even for uh, translating basic stuff and even for paperwork and stuff like that. So the dependence on an outsider within a community becomes more mm -hmm. and that brings down the decision-making capacity of the parents with regard to their own children, mm -hmm. you know, because then they are kind of answerable to the community, you see, mm -hmm. you know, so these, this uh, uh, difference in culture and attitudes is very well put by Geet Hofstein, who is, uh, who has floated a theory on cultural taxonomy. Now, it sounds very complicated when we say cultural taxonomy, Geet Hofstein and uh, all that, but mm -hmm. actually, this scientist, social scientist, has uh, nicely documented, you know, these attitudes. Like, for example, he says, cultures such as Pakistan, India, Afghanistan, Nepal, value a collectivistic orientation, okay? What this means is that those who are children of recent immigrants belonging to this culture are likely to use avoidance third party intermediaries or face saving techniques to avoid confrontation with the community. Okay, so uh, let me give you an imagery to explain this. Okay, um, there is a famous maxim among European Americans, okay, which says, pay attention, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Okay, which means that if you want to get your stuff done, okay, then you uh, you will be richly rewarded if you speak up. Okay, you will get the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Okay, do you understand how figuratively what that means? But op the opposite of that in the Japanese culture, which is, which is a collectivistic kind of a culture, the maxim goes like this. The nail that sticks out gets pounded, okay? It means that if you speak up, okay, you are likely to be beaten down, okay? So this, it's, uh, it's just a suggestion that please learn to blend in. Do not stick your neck out, okay, and say something. So once this is deeply ingrained in uh, your psyche, psyche it's very difficult to come out of it and this is also uh, seen in a lot of uh, south american culture also which is also a community oriented culture you know and people are very interdependent on each other so um this brings us to the question of uh you know double victimization so first of all you are victimized by the system because you're afraid of speaking up and you are victimized by your own community. So it's a case of double victimization which can lead to all kinds of psychological issues. And uh, when it comes to psychology, there is no cultural orientation. You know, that's, the, uh, that's also one of the things that need to be addressed. Let's move on to the crux of our discussion for today, which is prevention of sexual assault, okay? What can young students who are, say, very excited to uh, go to a new campus and a new life and still kind of getting adjusted, doing their own thing, trying to uh, cook up dinner, uh, things like that, self taking care of themselves. So what can students do in preventing sexual harassment in school campuses? What policies can institutions implement in order to prevent incidents of sexual assault in campuses? What can be done uh, to improve the situation? 
Sparsh, would you like to give us an insight into this? Sure, I can, I can start. Yeah, so I think a very fundamental thing that would go a long way in preventing sexual harassment in college campuses is educating people more, at least educating the children more or the students more regarding what's safe, what's acceptable in society and what's not. I think there's a really massive gap with that right now. I remember when we went into college, we didn't really spend that much time learning about what's okay and what's not. And since everyone's coming across the country, coming from different places, I think it's important to kind of set some boundaries and set some standards on the college campus and have a basic understanding of what's okay and not. Um, like people from California will be more aware of this stuff, but say if you're international where the culture is really different, then it might not be that important. And I think highlighting that's really important. Um, I also think that um, college campuses in general need to spend more time with their students outside of class and hold, hold trainings that, that would be beneficial to changing the mindsets of possibly misogynistic views that people people don't even know that, that they're misogynistic, right? So hosting sessions that would prevent that would be really insightful. Yeah, that's so true. That's so true. Uh, it's as if, uh, you know, uh, a young person is left in a lurch, you know, like, okay, as if uh, overnight, when you turn 18, you're like all grown up and stuff. And you can take care of yourself as if uh, one day before 18, you're not grown up. And one day after 18, you are like grown up and, you know, doing stuff. So that's um, that's a bit of a legal issue, so to speak, you know, and an issue of maturity as well. Uh, okay, what kind of uh, resources do you see in your colleges? Have you been given any orientation of the same? Yeah, so we've been given resources regarding uh, to help our mental health in case we're having problems such that like it's called uh, CAPS, I think, at SCU. Um, there's also the Office of Student Life, which deals with sex or sexual assault. I personally don't know anyone who's had to go there, but I also know that it's not the strongest part of SCU because they've, got, they've received a lot of backlash for a lack of funding, lack of faculty that are advising that sector in campus. So I think investing more in that's gonna be really beneficial to students' mental health and actually prevent, preventing sexual harassment as well. Uh, or dealing with victims, I think, especially. Um, or helping victims. Um, apart from that, I think there's also a very, very big gap between how males are uh males in my experience are not as open to talk about this kind of stuff that, than females and i think there should be some solution or some um time invested into making it a more normalized topic to discuss because if we don't have these discussions then we're not really going to move forward in society True, that's so true. So let me take you back to your high school. Was there any talk, discussion, anything at all at in the high school level? Yeah, in my high school, there were some talks. Me and Daniel actually went to the same high school and maybe he can corroborate on this. Um, there was a fair, not that much, but about we spent a week, a week and a half doing sexual education, which didn't, which talked about consent and which talked about general topics like that, but they didn't really address the culture or society that surrounds it, not as much as I would have liked. Um, Daniel, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I can jump in. So I would say that the high school mostly talked about, um, I guess, the process of, of doing that rather than, um, you know, cultural or societal or, or just any sort of thing that's surrounding it other than the process of it itself. Um, which which isn't great, especially since it is a high school. Um, and I think that, of course, you know, having proper social education is important. But at the same time, um, 
we're really lacking in the information of um you know like what what is sexual violence or what what is surrounding sex that is uh you know so bad that actually does occur um because it is it is true that things that are really bad do happen um but those things just aren't talked about as much because maybe because it's uncomfortable but also maybe because it's just hard to present that information um but you know despite that i think it is still important to present that information so true so true so uh, you said uh, you are in the music groups and everything so uh, do you have any late nights uh, within the campus where you're practicing and uh, it's pretty deserted in the campus uh, does that happen uh well I, i can kind of clarify my job real quick so i work for campus ministry which is a part of it's like a, a department in campus that focuses on helping students of all backgrounds and faith explore their their own faith journeys Um, and as a music accompanist intern for that department of the school um basically what it means is that i end up playing piano and various instruments at different events or different church activities um or, or masses like that um so there isn't a lot of time where i would say i'm i'm out late at night doing stuff like that or or if i am um it's usually the people who are from the church or with um you know a lot of the jesuit people who are from our university um can be priests can be employees um can be fellow students but i i wouldn't say that um that's really a spot where a lot of bad things happen just because it's a very safe environment and um it, it is run by the school right so it's very uh very safe for anybody and all are welcome is kind of the the mindset that we take with that situation okay okay so um what was the orientation uh you received from your parents um uh, uh do you commute to school or you are living in the dorms what uh, do you do you personally or for everyone for me or, or is that a question for everyone or just for me personally uh for you personally sure okay so last year i lived in the dorms this year i'm a commuter student i live about 20 minutes off campus um i i wouldn't necessarily say that changes too much with the way that i approach school um just because i do end up leaving campus quite late most days so i am um you know on campus most of the time so it's not so different okay so is there any specific reason why you chose to become a commuter after living in the dorms sure um i think the biggest thing is just cost uh, college education is expensive living in a dorm is incredibly expensive in comparison to um driving to school every day and, and just uh it seems like a, a smarter and more prudent choice to uh, to commute just because you'll save a ton of money Um, obviously if i lived in a different state or lived farther away um i probably choose to live in a dorm over some off campus housing um but because i'm in the situation i'm i'm lucky to be so close um that's why i opted in to be a commuter student so uh what are when you look around you what are uh the challenges for uh, people who are living in their dorm and whose family is say uh, far away what do you observe Well, g- given that I lived there last year, I would say it's hard for people to um I guess find a community or someone who they can trust in, especially if you're just moving into your dorm because you may not know so many people. Um I'm lucky that Sparsh is my roommate last year. We've been tight for some time. So, um you know, I know that if I ever had any problems or he knows if he ever had any problems, we can confide in each other. Um but let's say you move in and you, you don't know your roommate or you don't know anybody who's on campus. Um it can be really easy to feel alone and to feel like you can't really go to anyone. um which is it the case because we do have some facilities on campus that allow students to to go talk to anyone there's campus ministry like i mentioned earlier where you can just go in and and have a conversation um but there's also caps there's also other facilities on campus so i i would say um you know all in all yeah it is hard to to live in a dorm but at the same time um you can be a little bit smart about addressing that by looking and seeing what your school has to offer for you true that's true so i'm going to pass this question on to uh the other panelists uh whether they uh, live in their dorms or whether they are commuting so that we can get their side of the story as well so uh, can we start with kulsu um yeah sure so i commute to school um i live about 35 minutes away from campus um so yeah i mean it's not very like it doesn't trouble me much just it's really relaxing it's really nice um but yeah i don't i don't think i'd rather live at campus to be honest just because i'm not used to like the facilities in that sense i like being at home 
but um, yeah, on the majority, I'm a commuter student and will continue to be till I graduate. Until you graduate. Okay. What about the uh, meet? Yeah, I also commute. I live around like 20, 25 minutes away. So I'm planning on always commuting to school until I graduate as well, just because it saves money and overall it's just more comfortable. Okay, so Sparsh, uh, same thing? Yeah, I actually live in the dorms um, still the second year. Next year I might commute, but in terms of like what I've noticed in the dorms is that sometimes people will not get along that well with their roommate and they'll be left in like vulnerable situations. So for example, there was uh, someone who was walking around the hallway under the influence and her roommate kicked her out because her roommate didn't want to deal with that. And well, me and my roommate this year, we had to kind of take care of her, make sure she was safe and got back safely. But next day we found out that, um, that um, yeah, her roommate kicked her out. I thought that was like, that's something that's not okay, especially leaving someone who's not in their senses to kind of fend for themselves like that. And that's something that's really dangerous because someone could easily take advantage of them in that time, especially in the dorms. Um, I don't know about other colleges or universities, but um, uh, at Santa Clara University, the dorms don't actually have cameras inside because it's a privacy issue. So if anything happens to someone, there's no record of it except just word of mouth. And that's why I think some things should be done to kind of help that. And I don't know whether that's matching roommates better or having kind of sessions to bond with your roommates or simply not going with random roommates. I don't know what the solution is, but that's just some things I've noticed. True. So, uh, yeah, it's like you're stuck with a roommate, even if you don't get along. And that's uh, that's also eventually can become a mental health issue, you know, as well. So I want to take you back to this incident that you just uh, mentioned. So uh, you were two boys who were helping an incapacitated girl. Right. Am I understanding this yeah. right? right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So uh, this is like a perfect circumstance for uh, that girl uh, to be, you know, to, uh, um, to fall into, you know, wrong hands in the sense who could have taken advantage of her situation. Uh, and that's what has happened in multiple uh, campus uh, related drug facilitated sexual assault. You know, mm -hmm. and Brock Turner is one case in Stanford University where, uh, you know, he was found behind a dumpster by a passerby, you know. So, uh, so I want to ask you a question. What was going on in your mind? Did you find it a little bit risky to help this girl? I personally knew the girl before. So she actually lives on my floor on the other wing. Okay, let's not, uh, yeah, reveal her uh, details, but okay, you knew her, right? Okay. Yeah, I knew her before. So I personally didn't feel like I was uh, in a bad situation or I didn't, I didn't feel threatened helping her because I thought like, I wouldn't see her as my friend, but I didn't know who she was. Okay. But I can, I can definitely see if I didn't know her and I saw her walking around, I would feel kind of scared to help her in that situation because I didn't know what would happen. Uh, True. And some, uh, some other boy might think that, hey, I don't want to get into this. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. You, know, you, you want to kind of stay away from any kind of trouble, especially when it comes to your education and stuff. So a girl like that may not get help as well. Exactly, right? yeah. True. So there has to be some campus-wide uh, security to kind of take care of this uh, situation, right? So. Yeah. Yeah, so when I was a student, okay, a very simple thing like uh, the law enforcement came to my class and gave all the students a very loud whistle, okay, which we mm -hmm. had to kind of put it in our keychain and stuff. But I recall that having that keychain somehow gave me a sense of security. I don't know if I was going to use it or not, but having that with me 
felt made me feel safe somehow, especially in night classes and stuff. And especially when the campus is an open campus, which most of the campuses are, you know, colleges yeah. cannot have afford to have closed campuses because buildings are scattered throughout, right? Mm -hmm. So that's sort of a thing. Okay. Uh, talking about culture within a campus, I want to ask you a question. Okay. They say that when you are uh, especially living in the dorms, there is a strange sense of community in the college. Okay. As yeah. if everyone knows everybody mm -hmm. and people kind of let their guard down in the sense that they are not as careful as they would otherwise be because they're kind of used to the surroundings and they feel that everybody is pally pally, everybody is nice out here, right? So uh, do we, have you experienced that kind of a community that can be deceptive as well? 100%, yeah. I have a, uh, it's hard to judge people, especially in college, because you can't, without spending time with them, realize what kind of a person they are. And I think it's really deceptive, especially in today's society, for people to say something and then do something else. Um, coming back to your question, it is, it is very possible for you to feel very close to people and them to not feel close to you back, right? Mm -hmm. Just because you're not used to the way they're talking to you or, or any kind of situation like that. And that can get you in a lot of trouble in a number of ways. For example, they, you might feel really bad for um, if they don't invite you to one of their events or like something that they're doing or like talking in terms of sexual assault, like you would think that they'd tell you some things, but they don't, or I don't, yeah, I don't really know, but it can create very sticky situations when, especially in college when people don't reveal their true selves. Mm, that's true. So uh, uh, exactly, I mean, uh, in a lot of anonymous stories that I've read, people say that, okay, I thought this was safe and they have a sense of betrayal because uh, then, you know, they knew that this relationship is very temporary and uh, they uh, students end up living for a long time in the dorms, uh, thinking that I have friends and suddenly they don't have friends, you know, and the pressure to fit in is far more than uh, being a commuter, right? So I want to ask Guneet and I want to ask Kulsum, since you commute to school, is there any disadvantage that you face? Do you feel safer or do you, uh, are you able to kind of uh, get over the, any disadvantage that you may have uh, because you're commuting? Guneet, you want to go? Um, I don't know if I necessarily feel safer just because um, there are a lot of men or I guess people in the world that are that will assault you so I feel like it can happen anywhere so that sense of safety as just being like a woman in society I don't think that's ever going to decrease whether I'm in a dorm or I'm in my room like if I live at home like wherever I am like there could be somebody right and any disadvantages that I face as being a commuter student I don't really have any off the top of my head right now. Um, Kosum, do you want to add anything? Yeah, sure. So um, for me, I feel like I kind of agree, you know, just the difference between dorming and commuting isn't that significant because you're still on campus for a majority of the time. You're around the same people. You're going to the same events as them. You're taking part in the same activities. You know, like Daniel said, he um, he's on campus till pretty late regardless and leaves, right? And it, I'm in the same situation, like, I go in the morning, I leave pretty late. So it's like, whatever the student body or whatever my friends are involved in, I'm pretty involved in those things too. So their chances of, of being assaulted or being faced in some kind of situation like that is just as much as mine, you know? And in terms of disadvantages, I feel like that is a disadvantage, you know, regardless of whether you live there or you don't, you know, how often you're there or you're not, there's always a chance that that's gonna happen. So. So being commuters, do you also participate in the parties that happen uh, among the dorm students or uh, you are not part of the party culture? 
Um, personally, I make the effort not to be involved. That's just like a personal choice for me. Um, it's not something that I've always, I've really been involved in and I just don't want to, but that's not because like there's anything bad about it. It's just not my personal choice. So yeah. So what about uh, me? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I've been to like a few parties, but I don't take part in party culture as well, just as my personal preference. But if a commuter student wanted to, they definitely could. It's like you make the same friends, essentially. Um, they offer like my friends offer like I can stay in their dorm if they want to party at night. Like it's definitely an option. So like, like being a commuter student, like you can still be part of almost everything that you want to be a part of. Like it doesn't really change much. It's just your own preference, I would say. Yeah. So it's like the same safety as like me going to that same party versus like a person lives in dorm it's essentially the same thing if not worse kind of because if I can't stay in a dorm at night and I have to go home that's less safe because like the dorm's right there so they have to make it to the dorm I have to make it to the car I have to make it home so it's like it's a lot more vulnerability in that sense yeah uh, is it like uh drinking is an essential part of any party culture how was it like in the dorms I guess I can answer that. Um, no one, I mean, in my experience, drinking is not really that required because it's seen as a very negative connotation to try and force someone to drink. I know people have told me about instances okay. where where some people are forced to drink and then and their experience is not good. And that's definitely something that happens. Personally, it's not happened with me. And I think generally... Since last year, SCU or like generally culture has improved a lot regarding that. Uh, people don't drink from open cups or don't drink drinks that are handed to them now. And people are uh, a lot more careful about what they drink if they do decide to drink. I also know from personal experience that a lot of people have just decided not to drink generally in parties. And I see that shift in culture and students becoming more mature. So yeah. If I could add, there's like, um, like you said, there's a shift in culture and responsibility. Like I've also seen that, you know, almost all of like, every time my friend tells me about going to a party or being involved in some situation like that, um, there's always one person who makes the conscious effort just not to drink because they're the designated driver, you know? So it's like just that small effort is a change in itself over time because we used to see people were super responsible about that they didn't care if they drink and they drove but now they're like every time I speak to somebody I do hear that somebody made the conscious effort to just not do it to put everybody else in safety so there is that shift over generation of responsibility and maturity despite you know something like alcohol being there so yes right so that's very heartwarming to hear actually and that's what awareness does right it becomes a part of a conscious effort a part of habit you know that comes into you versus not having any knowledge about it and getting into a sticky situation because you uh, you were not aware that such a thing happened right so uh, wonderful good to know that uh, you know uh, young people are very conscious about their own safety because if you don't keep yourself safe then nobody else will right you just have to be very lucky if there's someone to take care of you in such a situation right so um in uh, at this juncture just for the benefit of the uh, listeners i would like to share a statistic so according to statistics presented by rain among undergraduate students 26.4% of females and 6.8% of males experience rape or sexual assault through physical force, violence, or incapacitation, right? So incapacitation is when you have had too much to drink and you're not in a position to take care of yourself. Okay, so uh, before I move on to uh, the next question, uh, I would like to ask uh, Sparsh when he mentioned that uh, there is some sort of drinking in the dorm, but do you see an overt display of machism when they say that, hey, uh, you know, I took advantage of a girl? Have you come across a cringy situation like that? Yeah, uh, that's never happened. And I think culture has really changed in terms of 
better for that. I've never heard a guy say that, uh, even overheard anyone say that. And I think saying that now can really get you into trouble because it's obviously not something good to do. And I think people are generally being more self-aware of their actions and they're being more careful about what actions they take and they're being more careful about what they do with people, which is really great to see. So I think there's a very, there's a distinct decline in machoism, at least in the Santa Clara campus. Uh, and I've never seen that or heard that. Wonderful. I, I can drop in as well real quick. I think that, I mean, also given my experience last year living with Sparsh and also um, even this year, just commuting among campus most of the time, um, I think that if anyone ever were to say something like that, it would also be met with a lot of opposition and, and you know, like just um, it wouldn't be taken the same way as it would have been taken 10, 20, you know, 30 years ago. Yes. Yes. Um, which is fantastic to see, but also I think that that's just a part of who we are at Santa Clara, um, that our culture is just very much, uh, it's about protecting every single person. And, and maybe that's not so explicit, but it definitely is implicit in the sense that, um, you know, like let's say I were to go to a party, which I don't usually because it's just not my scene. Um, somebody offers me a drink, I say no, they won't push it, they'll just stop. Because that's the the culture. That's the the uh, the thing that's understood is that if you say no, that's all you have to do. It's it's done. It's finished. Um, and also, I think in the case of uh, you know sexual assault or anything like that regarding uh, you know bad situations at SCU, all somebody has to do is just um, show that they're uncomfortable, and then people will back off. And I think that's just because um, that's that's who we are, and that's what we've developed right now. And um, just we're in a good place to be right now. I think that's that's what I'm trying to say. It's so true. So uh, people are respecting a no more these days. A no means a no, right? That's what brings us to the concept of uh, consent, you know, uh, which is mostly uh, male oriented as the literature of consent and everything goes. So I want to pose a question to the men out here to start off with, and then I'm going to build on it. Say uh, among a group of boys, okay, you are seen as advocates of anti-sexual violence and, you know, that sort of a thing. Maybe you're seen as a feminist in a male group, okay, uh, so to speak. But how will other men react to you? Say, if you are defending any girl who is incapacitated or any person who is vulnerable, even among boys, right? So how will you be seen? Will you be made fun of or what's like, what's going on there? Uh, I don't mind taking this first. I think um, I, I would answer that in, in different ways. The first way I would answer it is saying um, feminism is tricky because um, everybody's definition of feminism is different. I think that the true definition is making sure that women are equal to men, making sure that it's upheld. Um, some men take feminism the wrong way. They'll assume that it means that women are putting down men, which is not the case. That's not what it is at all. Um, but I think for the most part, most people do subscribe to that thought process that feminism is equality. And that's that's what we strive for. So um, I would say if I were to practice true feminism in college, which I do, and which a lot of people do at college, um, it would be met with respect, it would be met with support, and it would not be met with you know any opposition because that is the right thing to do. And I think that a lot of people are starting to understand now in more recent years that um, you know the right thing to do is to make sure that everybody's equal, that everybody's protected, everybody's safe. Um, and really, all of us are just trying to get through college, right? That's our purpose of being there. Um, so if we can coexist and get through college together and support one another, um, that's just the mindset that we all have nowadays, I think. Um, of course, there are going to be situations where some guys do some nasty things. There's going to be situations where um, you know, some people will believe that feminism isn't what it is. They'll believe that it's, it's women's superiority rather than equality. Um, but I would say for the most part, I feel comfortable supporting feminism. Um, I, I would assume that Sparsh would feel the same way and that most men on our campus would feel the same way just because um, that is what, what the culture is. It's that we, we make an attempt to make sure that everything is safe. True. Yeah, I completely agree with Daniel. Uh, 10, 20 years ago, it, it might have been an issue if, if I was, for example, hanging out with 
my male, all my male friends. And I said something like that, that might've been a problem, but in today's society, I think it's generally really actually looked up on, upon if you're uh, supporting women and being respectful because that's how we move forward. And that's kind of how our culture has changed. It's shifted to kind of take away from the negative connotation and make it really positive, which is great to see. Great, wonderful. So the- uh, uh, Just one, one more straight. thing. So kind of, kind of at the same time, although I think Sparsh and I do believe that, I don't want to take away from the situations where um, you know, there are going to be situations where certain men will look upon it with distaste um, or they, they will do that. So just the, the very real situation is that Sparsh and I can do our best. Um, a lot of men can do their best, but there are going to be men on campus who will be weird about it or who will, will just be really unsupportive or really aggressive towards it in that way. Um, so I think the takeaway from this is just, um, you know, everybody kind of do their part. But at the same time, be aware of what's out there. Um, don't just discredit the bad things that are happening because there's so much good, but be aware of both. Be careful. Have a rational attitude, right? True. So I'm going to pose this question to uh, Gunit and uh, Kulsum. Uh, I personally, in this uh, panel, we look at you as uh, South Asian representatives of other South Asian uh, children who are growing up in the U.S., you know, from that point of view, what kind of conversations do you have with your parents when it comes to rights, when it comes to safety? You know, uh, I'm sure there is a lot of negotiating going on. And uh, how do you make, how do you, what kind of communication channel uh, do you share with uh, your parents? Agunit, would you like to go first? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, for my parents personally, um they're pretty reasonable in the sense of like I want to do something and then we can talk about it but for like the majority of the culture that I see like my friends um who are also like from Bobby like me it's very like strict like the boys can stay out until like 4 a.m but the girls have to be back by like 7 p.m it's like the guy can come home drunk but the sister can't even look at alcohol okay like it's just it's completely like crazy how like how the sexism is and what's even more crazy is that the parents are well aware of their sexism it's like I, I have friends where they talk to their parents they're like and they're like you're just saying this because I'm a girl they're like yeah we are because you are a girl you have to be treated like this and it's like it's there's no reasoning with them because they just accept the fact that they're sexist and they're like you know what like this is the world we live in this is how you have to act and it's I want to say it's getting better but at the same time it's not because things aren't really changing like the parents' mindsets aren't changing, but this new generation's mindset is different, you know? So in regards of parents, I feel like coming to them and being like, hey, I got sexually assaulted, a good majority of them are going to be like, what were you wearing? What were you doing? Why were you in this situation to begin with? Like, why didn't you say no? Like, like why didn't you, like, just completely victim blaming you? The small percent will be like, okay, like, I'm sorry that happened to you but like we can't really do anything about it like you can't really report it and like I feel like maybe one or two parents out of like 100 or 200 will be like okay let's report it like I don't think it's that big of a change yet to be like oh we're growing as a culture no I don't think so I don't think that's happening yet true so, yeah and most commonly it's observed that parents in a completely new uh, country and situation, they grow up with their children, you know, in understanding the uh, surroundings, understanding the culture. And also uh, many parents have very funnily told me that they supply us with a lot of terms and terminology like sexism, racism. Uh, we, uh, we, they may not essentially know the essence of what this means, but through their own children, uh, uh, young young people today, uh, even parents are getting matured in terms of how they want to communicate to their with their own children, you know. So, Kulsum, go for it. Go ahead. Um. So for me, I think I have a a very maybe a little opposite side of the spectrum for me because um, growing up, my communication has always been very open with my parents. You know, they've always like whatever restrictions they've put on me, whatever rules they are, they've always given me some kind of reasoning and like understanding behind it. You know, one thing that they've always told me as I grew up, every time I asked like, okay, but why can't I go here? Why can't I do that? 
um, what they always said was, it's not that we don't trust you, it's that we don't trust people in the world, you know? And so every time they told me that, it just kind of made me understand where they're coming from. Like, it's not me that they're like, they don't, it's not that they think I'm a bad kid or I'm going to go and do something bad. It's they don't trust people, you know? And I felt like that's very justified. And so as I grew up and I was taught that, it just made it a lot easier to understand why they're saying no to something, you know? So like into adulthood, it became less of blaming my parents and more of just being like, okay, you know, I get it. And I feel like if it was the same with most families and most parents, just having that open communication, like letting their kid know we're not imposing restrictions on you because you're bad. It's just because the world is bad and that's a reality of life. You know, so I feel like because I had that, it was easier for me to listen and not want to like rebel. But when it comes to like other families, you know, in my community, in the Muslim community, um, being raised here, it's kind of the same. I've seen the same like thing going on because parents are very scared when they raise their children in a Western society. You know, I feel like there's a lot more like carefulness and awareness to put on their child because they're like, okay, but what if it goes wrong? There's so much to risk not only for them but for us too you know but in my community it's kind of the same thought process exercised onto our children that it's not you who we don't trust it's the world and that's kind of raised everybody around me in the same way and when the situation does come up in like the unfortunate case where there is some kind of assault or there is a victim it's handled within the family you know it's it's not always it's not like a bad thing for us to speak out and say like, okay, this happened, you know? And I feel like that's a very good thing, but that also stems from just the way the parents raise the kid and the way they teach them the repercussions and the meaning of what they go through, you know? So uh, as like different as my perspective is from Gunit, it's just about the environment you're raised in and what you're taught about the situations you get faced. That's so true. So uh, articulately put all of you, um, and, you know, see, uh, communication is the key, right? Your parents telling you that, hey, we trust you, we don't trust the world, means a lot. It clarifies a lot of things. It takes out so much of confrontation in that argument when uh, things are so clearly put, right? So uh, kudos to the parents also who are growing uh, along with their children and trying to understand that uh, they are raising their children in a very different environment than they grew up in. So um, wonderful. You, uh, I, this is out of my script, but I'm telling you that uh, you, uh, all of you have been so articulate today and you have given me some insights at, on a personal level about life for young people, which I'm personally going to use with my kids, uh, I guess. And that's so true for uh, our listeners as well. So um, I'm going to summarize this discussion uh, for the benefit of our listeners. So we were able to examine the problem of campus sexual, sexual assaults in all its dimensions today, maybe power dynamics, cultural aspects, uh, barriers to reporting. And uh, I'm sure, uh, uh, our listeners today have got some semblance in terms of what I should be doing uh, if I am in this situation. You know, of course, we still have a very long way to go before sexual assault is treated with universal fairness on college campuses and beyond. But it is our hope that more and more discussions around this topic, the dialogue surrounding sexual assault and campus rape culture, undergoes a transformation and more and more people and programs declare that is absolutely never any excuse for a sexual assault. Now, what can we do as students? Well, uh, as students, you can get involved in uh, campus activities that will ensure uh, maybe more volunteering activities and like-minded people so that you have a community within the campus. That's a good way to go. Know your resources. Once you are in a new campus, half of the students do not know their rights, do not know what's available to them in terms of mental health, in terms of uh, uh, any, any kind of resources in the campus. So be aware of that. So at the end of this panel discussion, um, uh, this is the call to action that we can give to the community 
parents, you can have a great communication channel with your children. Our children are very articulate and uh, they are very open to new ideas and want to succeed and do well in life. Uh, students, uh, take care of yourself on campuses. That's inevitable. You have to live on campus. You have to go and uh, go out there into the world. So these values are going to help you uh, wherever you go, right? So next, uh, I would like uh, the audience here to take a survey. Uh, since uh, after you have uh, listened to all these uh, discussions around this topic. So this survey helps uh, Maitri to devise new and new programs, you know, and understand the changing trends and what does, what society needs. So since uh, its inception 31 years ago, Maitri has in, uh, evolved itself according uh, to the changing times and societal concerns. So please go ahead and take the survey, which is in our chat box right now, uh, so that we can collate all the data and understand how, uh, what more programs uh, can we bring about. Uh, while that's happening, I would also like to go uh, into our uh, QA session. Now this survey, uh, up there, it's not going to take more than two minutes, maybe even one minute. There are about three or four questions in there. So please go ahead and once you're done, hit submit so that it comes into our database. So um, next, I think we would be, uh, I'm, I'm checking for some questions in the chat box that our listeners have put in. Uh, let me just go ahead and scroll up and see if there is any question, comments from the uh, things. Louis Lee has a question. Let me go to the chat box one more time. Okay. Okay, Louis' question is this. Anonymous reporting is a crucial option when it comes to sexual assault. Students should be able to report anonymously and access healthcare services needed afterward without naming the assailant. Can students report assault anonymously? Anonymous reporting is a crucial option when it comes to sexual assault uh, students should be able to report anonymously and access healthcare services needed afterward without naming the assailant. Okay, this has come again. Information about sexual assault should be easily accessible on a campus that has both males and females. Is information about sexual assault easily available on campus? Anybody wants to take this question? Have you heard about anonymous reporting on campus? Um, so I know that there is anonymous reporting regardless. Um, I just came to SU last year and you know, before that at my community college, there was anonymous reporting. You go and you tell them, you file a report, you, you know, say everything that happened. You have absolutely no obligation to name who you are, um, which is a very good resource. And I'm going to assume that SU has the same thing. I'm not entirely sure on the situation, but I think so because it is available on most institutions just as like a basic thing. You know, it, you absolutely do not have to say who you are if you're reporting a situation like that that's happened. Um, and in terms of sex, uh, information about sexual assault being easily accessible, at SU, I know there is information about it. I know that it is available, but it isn't always easily navigated, which is probably, you know, at the center of the problem. Um, I do know I've had conversations with some friends and students that have told me that, like, you have to go through this link and then that link and then that link and then go to this and that to actually navigate the information that you need, um, which I guess speaks on that it needs to be taken a bit more seriously, at least at our campus. So yeah. So uh, true. So uh, uh, even I came across a, a one of uh, one case where uh, after the Me Too movement, uh, people uh, across campuses uh, were encouraged to report anonymously. 
uh, the cases on Instagram and every university had at least dozens of cases coming up, which were actually not reported because of fear of, uh, uh, you know, backlash and stuff. Uh, however, it served a purpose, a psychological purpose for those who uh, went to that Instagram account and reported their experience uh, to tell other students that uh, they are not alone in this game. I mean, this has happened to a lot of people. So that's a little heartwarming for a person who failed to report uh, in the sense that it gives them a mental solace that, and uh, it, the, it brings, the, brings down the self blame to a great extent. So anonymous reporting is the key to, you know, protect a person's identity and, you know, and, uh, and ensuing, you know, backlash, right? So let me go to another question that we may have. Okay, thank you. Questions for okay. Mukta has a question. Uh, she says, My question is for all four participants. Uh, in a culture, both mainstream and South Asian, where aggression for men is seen as desire, interest, okay, uh, and reluctance from women is often seen as coquettishness. How do you personally understand and express consent? Also, how might this get more complex, complex layered in non-heterosexual trans encounters? So basically, it's the male stereotype of being uh, aggressive where aggression for men is seen as desire and reluctance for women is often seen as you know ideal or coquettishness uh, how do you personally understand and express consent okay so consent is a very big narrative in uh, uh, in assessing whether an assault has actually happened so uh, what is what are your thoughts on that um, my thoughts on consent is that it's pretty simple. Like, yes, there is a little bit of like, um, as the question was saying, that men need to be like aggressive and stuff. But at the end of the day, like all the aggression that's like desired is playfulness. Like it's like jokingly. So when it comes down to like actual consent, it's always very clear, like if the girl wants to do it or not. And so I, I don't really think it's an excuse to be like oh I thought you wanted me to be aggressive that's I don't think that's ever an excuse I think it's very clear and in terms of non-heterosexual relationships I think it's the same thing um it doesn't matter your gender if you say no that means no and if like I don't like it's simple to me I don't think there are many it can get complex in a relationship where you say if you think oh you're dating somebody you can do whatever you want whenever you want that's not fair and that's not true and I think that's something that people should be educated on just because he's your boyfriend doesn't mean um he doesn't have to he needs to ask for consent every time he does something so I think making consent sound complex is just adding to the issue because it makes it sound like oh but I wasn't sure like there's so many levels no like no means no you know so if you say oh consent is complicated I think that's part of the problem because it's never complicated and never should be complicated. No matter what the gender is, trans, heterosexual, homosexual, it at the end of the day, it's really obvious when a person doesn't want to do something. So I don't think it's ever an excuse to be like, oh, I didn't know. It's not a thing. So yeah. true, so true. So uh, what about Kulsum? Somebody else would like to answer this question? Um, I feel like Gunit articulated it very well. It's as basic as no it's like it's one word and I don't think it needs to be more complex or it needs to be like picked apart any more than that it doesn't matter what gender you are what sexuality you are no is no it's one word and if you don't understand that you are the problem I feel like that it's as simple as that it's so true how about uh uh Sparsh and Daniel yeah I think I think they covered the topic well at the end of the day we can't really be relying on social constructs to it also imply consent at the end of the day it should be very very explicit and a no should be a no and 
that's kind of how it should be addressed. Very true. Very true. Daniel? Yeah, I don't think I have anything further to add. I would just say, like, it, it really is that simple, right? No means no. Um, if you need more information than that, something's clearly wrong. Um, so true. just oh, approach it so simply because it's it's really is just that simple. It's so true. And uh, uh, at least a few years uh, back, uh, the concept of consent had a lot of uh, cultural undertones. And that's why this question becomes even important because the way a woman expresses consent is very different from how a male would express consent. And it gets even more complex when it comes to uh, other uh, non-heterosexual and trans uh, relationships. So in this, uh, the latest research says that uh, uh, there is a push to seek what is called as enthusiastic consent, where participants are asked to look for a presence of a yes, rather than the absence of a no. So you didn't say no, so it means yes, you know, so that argument doesn't hold good anymore. So that's the that's called as enthusiastic consent where uh, the whole body language uh, conveys a certain level of enthusiasm in uh, any encounter. So consensual relationship or consensual sexual encounter and non-consensual sexual encounter, it has a barrier in consent, right? That's what is the deciding factor to, you know, for it to take a very different term. Right, so uh, wonderful question, uh, Mukta, and even more wonderful answers from our panelists. So I think it clarifies a lot of things in terms of consent. So, uh, yes, we have one more question out here. In terms of dealing with sexual assault as a POC and the culture of handling situations a bit differently. What do you think the connections are when it comes to speaking out and being more open about your story? How do you think the way of growing up as a POC has effect, affected the way we reached out for help when things like this happen? Why don't you think more individuals speak out and what can we do about it? Okay, can uh, the person asking the question clarify what POC is? Am I missing something here? Person of color. Oh, person yeah. of color. Okay, wonderful. So um, go ahead. So the question, let me summarize the question. Uh, how do you think the way of growing up as a person of color has affected the way we reach out for help? So this ties us back to the cultural question that we covered. So anybody would like to take it up? How does culture uh, define your ability to report? Um, I think it's, again, very much about the environment you're raised in and the values you're taught. You know, it's like many situations can be taught to you to process in different ways. Like for example, like independence, you know, you can teach a girl your independence enables you and it gives you a life and it gives you freedom or you can teach her that it's bad for you and, and it's like not okay culturally, you know? So it's like, there's different aspects to the way you can teach things and that includes the way you decide if you should report or not. You know, it, it very much stems from the environment you're raised in and the people who teach you, you know, and I feel like as a person of color in Western society, as I mentioned before, it's like there's a lot of risk factors that come from all aspects, whether it be your family, your parents, um, your siblings, your friends, the society you come from, the, the culture you come from. There's a lot of things riding on that, you know, and I feel like those are the biggest effect effect uh, effect factors if those weren't involved it would be very easy for a person to be like okay this is something bad that happened to me and the justice system is something that helps people so that's where I should go and I should report it you know but before that is like a wall of like 50 other things because that's what they're taught growing up you know like it's not just about you it's about everything and it should be just about them because they are the victim and they are the person it happened to. And I feel like people of color face this significantly more than, you know, just 
people who aren't people of color. <laughs> so um, yeah, I feel like that that's probably the biggest thing growing up. It's just about how you're raised and yeah. And addressing the other part, why don't you think more individuals speak out? I feel like this is the reason, you know, it's like a, it's like a, um, a herd community kind of thing. If one person thinks one way, everybody else is going to be like, okay, well, I'm going to think like that too. And then everyone else around them is going to accept that, you know? So it's about accepting a change in viewpoint or a change in mindset, you know? So I feel like those are the biggest points. So true. Gunit, you would like to add something? Um, I think culture-wise, reporting things, um, it's pretty difficult because I feel like me and Kusum answered this in the discussion previously. It's basically the same question. It's like, it depends on the way you were raised, your culture around you. And I think mental health has a lot to do with it too. It's like mental health growing up isn't really a thing in South Asian cultures. It's like, you're sad. No, you're not. Like, go outside. Like, it's not really spoken about so I think it's essentially the same thing depends on your environment environment support system and everything right um how is it for boys is the experience a little different than it is for boys or girls and whatever anything anything that uh, boys do not face that girls face that comes to your mind be honest um, <laughs> I mean in terms of reporting I wouldn't feel as uncomfortable as some other guys. I know some other guys would feel uncomfortable reporting. Uh, I don't know why. It's probably because of some historical um, culture gaps or something like that. But me personally, I would have no problem with that because I guess I'm used to the new culture. Daniel, what about you? Uh, well, okay. Personally, I, I would say it's not about what's being recorded, but rather like just me being myself, I'm not a huge fan of being recorded in, in any capacity. So this is a, a bit of a step for me in, in numerous ways. Um, but I think it does need to be said, does it be done, so, which is why I'm here, which is why I'm willing to be here and spend this time because I think it is important. Um, so I guess what I would say is, uh, well, yeah, there are going to be people who who are okay with being recorded and, and not okay with being recorded, but those are for many different reasons. And um, sometimes the reasons can be that they don't believe in it. Sometimes the reasons can just be um, similar to my reason, which is just not super comfortable being on camera or or being out there in the world. True. And how often do our parents tell us when we are kids, you know, be a good girl, be a good boy, whatever that means. It means don't get into trouble, you know, and we uh, tend to take it to an extreme when we are actually in trouble, you know, and uh, that is deeply ingrained in our psyche, right? So let me look for more questions in the chat box. Looks like I don't see any unless I'm missing something. So this uh, brings us to the end of today's panel discussion. And thank you very much for your insight and participation in this very important discussion. We know your time is precious and we have been kind of, you know, trying to touch base with you in the last two weeks and we have realized you are very busy. So we are immensely grateful that you were able uh, to carve out some time with us. Uh, and to our awesome listeners, thank you for making this worthwhile for Maitri through your participation. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.